Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so this session is uh, titled Open Flow and High Performance Computing. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Professor Yashar Ganjali, who's an associate professor at the uh, University of Toronto. He's actually coming back to the Bay Area. He graduated uh, from Stanford uh, a number of years ago. And he's presenting work uh, with his students, Sajjad Shirali Shahrza. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'll hand it to him. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. This is a joint work with my student, Sajjad Shirali, uh, who was supposed to present the work. But uh, his visa was not ready in time. And I have a feeling uh, that has something to do with the word security in the title of the paper. So before I start, I have a disclaimer. Despite what that tiny little word might suggest, this is not a work on security. We basically made a simple observation about software-defined networking and a class of applications that potentially can run in this environment. Based on that observation, we make a question of how we can implement those kind of applications, security being one of them, uh, in an efficient way. We suggest an extension to OpenFlow for, to answer that question, basically. And then at the end, we justify our suggestion and our proposal using port scan detection as an example of, of applications that can be uh, run in this model. And to summarize, this paper is not about security. And as you can see with the number of simple words, if you want to associate a word with the paper, I'd rather you associate it with the word simple, not security. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> but they are going to see this, so just for the record. So the observation that I mentioned, there are a large class of applications where uh, in some scenarios, for example, when the size of the network is small, you might be able to implement them as applications in the controller of a software-defined network. And for some of these applications, implementing them as an application on the controller might, in fact, reduce the cost and complexity of the network. Security applications are one example of such applications. But unfortunately, these applications sometimes need packet level information. Here are a few examples. If you want to detect botnets in a network, you need to see the connection patterns and sometimes the contents of packets. In a software defined network, usually that information is not available to the controller. In port scan detection, which I'm going to talk about in more detail later on, you need to see the header of the packet and into arrival times. If your service is implemented as an application in the controller, you might not have access to that information. In warm detection, you usually require uh, access to the packet content to be able to verify certain signatures. And again, that is not available in, in software-defined network controllers. So software-defined networking, as you know, is a very hot topic these days. Different people have different views of what it is. But one thing that people usually agree on is we have a separation between the data path elements and the control plane in, in the software-defined network, which means we have a few channels of information. In OpenFlow, these channels are event-based messages. These are events in the system like link up and down, any changes in the topology and the structure of the network. We have flow statistics, which are collected by the switches and pulled by the controller. So again, these are uh, in open flow. Other implementations might have variations. But in open flow, switches gather statistics about individual flows. And occasionally, on demand, the controller can, can pull that information. And there are packet in messages. When a switch doesn't know what to do with a specific packet, it will send a copy of the packet to the controller. So if you look at these three different information channels between the data path element and the controller, you can see that most of the information is at the flow level. So you have very, very limited access to packet level information, which is required by some applications if you want to implement them 
in, in controller as controller apps. This is not an intrinsic property of software-defined networking, of course. It is a side effect of how OpenFlow has been designed and implemented because OpenFlow deals with flows rather than individual packets for the purpose of minimizing the load on the controller. It ignores packet level information most of the time. What I just said, it doesn't mean that we don't necessarily have access to packet level information in, in OpenFlow. There are ways of gaining packet level information. These are two options that I could think of. The first option is not to install a rule in the, uh, in the switch, in a specific switch on the path. What happens in that case is that the switch doesn't know what to do with a specific packet, and it's going to forward that packet to the controller. So whenever you want to see the content of a packet, you just avoid installing a rule for that specific packet or that specific flow uh, on the path, at least on one of the switches on the path. The second option is to actually install rules that divert the traffic towards a specific device. Let's say you have a firewall box in your network and you install rules that divert the traffic towards the firewall. Or you have a, a tapping system in place, you want to log things in your network. You specifically install rules that sends traffic towards that specific machine in your network. Both of these options work but they have their own limitations. The first approach, what it does is puts the controller on the packet delivery path. So if every single packet goes to the controller, you essentially are creating a potential bottleneck in your network. And it can hurt the, the, the performance of the network in some situations. And the second problem with this, this approach is that depending on what your switch decides to do, the switch might and sometimes will just send parts of the packet rather than the entire packet. The, the way the OpenFlow specifications are designed is up to the switch. They, they can send the entire packet to the controller or they can cut parts of the packet and forward just that part and buffer the actual packet on the data path elements. So even if you do this, there's a chance that your controller application does not still see the entire packet. Diverting traffic to a specific box has its own shortcomings as well. First of all, you might end up with a huge overhead in the network if you divert most of your traffic towards the controller. Sometimes the overhead is unnecessary because your application might actually need certain parts of the traffic, but this way you're sending almost all of the traffic towards, towards your monitoring box. And in some situations, the, the complexity might be too high for having multiple monitoring boxes. For example, if you have a small enterprise network, you don't want to have separate boxes for different applications in your network. Now, if you look at the existing options I just mentioned, they seem to be black or white. You either have no access to packet information or you have to send all the traffic towards your controller to be able to see the packet contents. And now the question is, is there a simple mechanism to provide a tunable channel that can give you some information and you can increase or re decrease the amount of information you re you're receiving through that channel? And that's the question we are going to answer in, in, in this talk. So our proposal to solve this problem is what we call Flexam. Flexam is a flexible sampling extension proposed for OpenFlow. It's proof flow sampling and provides a new information channel between data path elements and the controller. What happens in Flexam is that the controller defines four things. The first thing is which flows you want to choose for sampling. For a flow to be sampled, then you define how the sampling actually works. Are you going to need stochastic or deterministic? What rate of sampling you need to have? For packets to be sampled, you choose what parts of the packet, the header, header plus parts of the payload, etc., are to be sampled and sent to the controller. And at the end, you, ha you, you can decide where these samples are sent to. Usually, you're going to send them to the controller because your app is running on the controller, but you have, to, you have the option of sending it to any arbitrary device in your network. We believe it's a simple but flexible 
solution to the problems that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Lexam does not provide a novel sampling scheme. We rely on techniques that have been known. The two uh, common uh, sampling techniques we use are stochastic sampling. You flip a coin. It's not a coin. Uh, you generate a random number. If it's less than row, you basically forward to the controller. Otherwise, you just uh, ignore the packet. In deterministic sampling, you choose m consecutive packets out of every k packets from a certain flow, and you just skip the first delta packets of the flow. So what this means is if you set m equal to 1, you're sampling 1 out of every k packets, which might be interesting for applications that require heartbeat from flows going on in your network. That can be used for estimating the rate of flows. Currently, the only way to do that is for uh, the controller to frequently pull uh, the, the statistics from switches. And that might produce a high volume of traffic in the network. For m greater than 1, if you set k almost to infinity, what it means is that you're just going to see the first few packets of the flow. This is suitable for applications uh, where you need the first few packets of the, the flow. For example, if you're doing traffic classification, there are schemes out there that can do a very good job by looking at the first few bytes of the flow. So setting m to some number and k to infinity ensures that you see the first m packets of the flow. And using delta, you can skip the first few packets of the flow. For example, if you're interested in detecting uh, long-lived flows, elephant flows as we call them, then you can set m to a delta to a large value, meaning you're going to skip the first delta packets of the flow. If the flow is short and finishes there by then, you're not going to see any packets of that flow. If the flow is long, you're going to start seeing packets from that flow. So how we add this to the existing open flow specification? We define OF path sampling as a new action. And it's easy to add it to the existing open flow implementations and specifications. If you, a specific flow doesn't have this action, there is no overhead for, for adding this, this action. And the parameters are in line with what I just mentioned in the previous slide. You have a scheme, m, k, and delta are the parameters I mentioned for the deterministic sampling parameters. Rho is the rate of sampling for st stochastic sampling. And we have the destination where it defines uh, where the packets, the sampled packets are forwarded to. On the switch side, there's minimum requirements on the switch side for the stochastic. It's just a generating a random number, comparing it with a fixed number row. For deterministic sampling, you don't need to have extra state and extra memory because open flow comes with this uh, received packet counter. For every flow, OpenFlow keeps track of the packets you have received already. And you can easily check to see if, if the packet belongs to the sampling scheme by take, taking this basically equation. If you reduce delta, take the remainder by dividing by k. And if it's less than m, you're going to sample it. Otherwise, not. So this is simple math. It doesn't require any extra state by the controller. And we believe there are a lot of applications that can use something like this. Traffic classification, quality of service, diagnostics, and troubleshooting are examples that come to my mind. But what I'm going to do next is to talk about port scan detection as an application that can rely on a scheme like this. And along the way, I need to talk about elephant flow because we need that elephant flow detection uh, because we need that for port scan. And for both of these, I'm going to talk about the accuracy as, the, uh, as a function of the load we are generating in this network. So port scan detection, there are attackers, they are scanning your network, and you want to identify them. And we want to see how we can use FlexSAM to find and identify those uh, attackers. The algorithm we are using is called threshold random walk algorithm, and it's studied before in the industry. It's not something new we came up with. So what it does is uh, assumes the probability of a fi failed connection is very low for 
legitimate hosts. If a host is a benign host, you're not going to have a failed connection most of the time. But if you have an attacker, a lot of your requests are going to be uh, denied and you ha you're going to have failures. So but based on this observation, we are going to maintain what we call a, an attacker likelihood, likelihood ratio. We are going to increase this ratio any time when a connection fails for a specific host, and we are going to reduce it when, whenever a connection succeeds. And success and failure are basically defined this way. If you have two UDP packets on a flow, you call that a success. If you have at least one other packet other than TCP SYN packet on a TCP connection, we call that a success. Again, this is not something we came up with. This already exists. It has been studied in the literature. We are just trying to implement it using Flexa. And how we are going to evaluate is we have implemented our own simulation environment. The data set we are using is something taken from the literature. What we have in that data set is a, a, two different subsets of data, benign traffic and attack traffic. And we can combine them, increase the rate, and decrease the rate of attacks uh, by basically shifting the time and uh, scaling time. And you can find more details about the data set in the paper. I'm not going to talk about those. And we have created new 20 different trials. And what I'm presenting is the aggregate of those results. So if you look at Flexam, there are flows going in throughout your network. And you want to identify uh, port scan attacks. There are two problems that you might encounter. The first one is flow shortening. So there is a flow going on through, throughout your network. Since you are sampling with a rate probably less than one, you're not going to see all the packets of the flow. So even if the flow has multiple packets, which means the flow was a success, you might end up by seeing just one of those packets. And you might uh, decide this is a failed connection. And it will lead to false positives in that case. The other pro problem is what we call flow reduction. You have a lot of flows. Some of these flows, including the attacks, are extremely short. If you're relying on sampling, you might end up missing a huge number of these short flows. And as a result, you might have a large number of false negatives in your system. Sorry, did I skip? No. So how we address these two problems? For flow shorten shortening problem, what we are going to do is if we see any TCP packet, which is not a SYN packet, we are going to uh, count that connection as a success. So if host A and B talk to each other, there is one packet I can see. There is one TCP packet, which is not TCP SYN. I'm going to count that as a successful connection. For UDP, if I see one packet of a given flow, I'm going to in, uh, immediately install a rule with Flexam with parameters m equal to 1 and k set to infinity. What it means is if there is another packet of this flow, definitely sample and send that packet to me. So if after installing this rule, another packet of the same flow goes through that switch, I'm going to see that. So I'm increasing the likelihood of seeing uh, the second packet, assuming I have seen one packet from the UDP traffic. And that hopefully will reduce my chances of falsely marking a flow as, as an attack. For flow reduction problem, as I mentioned, we have a large number of flows. And majority of those flows are very short. So if you are sampling, there is a chance you might not see some of those flows. So what we are going to do is rely on observation, which was basically the core of the keynote talk this morning. That is a large number of flows. Sorry, a lot of traffic is carried by only a small number of flows in the network. So in, in our data set, 6% of less than 6% of flows carry more than 95, 96% of traffic, depending on whether you counted packet, packets or bytes in your traffic. So the idea here is if we can identify these long flows, which obviously are not attacks, and we can exclude them from our data set, then 
we might be able to do much better by increasing the sampling rate for the mice, for the short flows in the network. So this is, this graph is where those numbers came from. If you look at number 50%, less than 6% of flows have flow durations of more than 50%, but more than 95, 96% of the traffic is carried by those flows. <coughs> so here's the, uh, the algorithm, if I uh, may repeat. What you're going to do is you're going to sample all of your traffic with a predefined rate row all of the traffic. The controller is going to receive a large fraction of packets of any given flow. As soon as you receive more than epsilon, epsilon is an integer, packets from the same flow, you're going to mark that flow as an elephant flow and you're going to exclude it from, uh, from your future sampling by installing a rule on the switch and removing the, the sample action on, on that rule. So from this point on, what happens is that you're going to, over time, build up a flow table which excludes sampling for elephant flows. But assuming your row is not extremely small, you're still going to see a large fraction of your mice and short flows in the network. So he, the, in this graph, uh, the, the two axes here are the row and epsilon parameters and the z-axis is the, the load in the network. And as you can see there is a large region over here basically row less than 10 and epsilon less than 10. In that region load is basically very close to zero. It's less than 0.4 percent for anything with row less than 10 and epsilon less than 10. Rho equal to 10, it means I'm sampling one out of every 10 packets. But I'm one out of 10 packets in the network can sound uh, like a large number, but noticing that I'm just excluding long-lived flows from the network, you can see that the, the overall load on the system is not that high. So if you look at the accuracy of the results we are getting, when the attack rates are 10, 100, and 1,000 packets per second, we have an accuracy of almost 100% for any pair of rho and epsilon, which means even if I keep rho and epsilon very small, in my previous figure, when rho and epsilon are small, the load is very close to zero. So for any pair of rho and epsilon, my accuracy is almost 100%, which means very, very low leads to very high accuracy in the system. For the other two cases, these are when the attack rates are much smaller. One packet per second sent by the attacker or 0.1 packets per second sent by the attacker. So the attacker sends one packet every 10 seconds, which means I might be easily miss those. So for those cases, the load is still relatively low. I have 0.7 and 0.25% load in the network for those values of rows and epsilon. So just to compare, if I had to uniformly sample rather than eliminating elephant flows for the attack rate of 0.1 and 1, I would have needed 60% load and 7% load in the entire network. And to compare with other methods, this is the load uh, in our scheme for different data rate at the attack rates Uniform sampling load varies between 60%. As the attack rate goes up, since you can sample with a smaller rate, 1% is the load in the network. In the previous scheme, Medi et al., which is the baseline we are relying on, the load changes between 1.1 to 47%. And if you just look at the packet in messages in, an, in a system where you have reactive flow routing, this, is not, this has nothing to do with uh, detecting port scan. You have a system, it's reactive. You don't install rules unless the controller sees the first packet of the flow. The load can vary between 0.7 up to 47%. So you can see that the overhead of adding FlexSAM is extremely low in this game. So in, in, to summarize what you can do with, with uh, FlexSAM, in a small networks you can install the application on the controller, use sampling to send packets, 
and let the application do the work for you. For larger networks, you might still have multiple boxes because of the destination field you have in the Flexam um, uh, specification. You can divert parts of your traffic in an intelligent way. Rather than sending all the traffic, you sample and send parts of it to specific devices you have in your network. And overall, it gives you a tunable uh, information channel between your data path elements and the controller. So I presented FlexSAM. Hopefully, I've been able to com uh, convince you it works for a specific application. There are other applications I haven't talked about, and I'm happy to talk about them during the break later on. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So who's doing the calculation of, uh, who's doing the sampling? Is the, the controller sends the messages? The controller application, yes. Yeah, so it sends messages to the switch, right, to extract, exactly. to query the switch, because the switch itself cannot send no, anything no. back to the controller. So the, in the, uh, the specification we have come up with, you have to tell the switch what is the rate you want to sample. Right, right. So the, the controller does that and also does the calculation, right? Exactly. So, right. so one of the interesting things you can do is you can increase and decrease the rate depending on the load on the controller. If you are in a situation where there isn't much traffic towards the controller, you might increase row and get a better uh, accuracy and visibility into your yeah. flows. By reducing the sampling rates when the network is highly loaded, you're compromising your security, but at least you're you're keeping the network running. Uh, are you able to, ec to expose that? The r you calculate the rate, right? You can effectively calculate the flow rate. That's right. right. Do you expose that to the user somehow? Uh, who is the user? Me. I, I want to like you can, you type a command and say, you, give me the flow rates yeah, for absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We've been doing do the same thing for a year now. So <laughs> all right. for a different application, we'll talk later. Interesting. Um, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering about the extension to OpenFlow that you need uh, to get the sampling. And I would love to have this extension myself for doing classification of flows, mm -hmm. uh, not just for security. Uh, especially if you're just interested of detecting the relevant flows for basically using different paths, you don't need a very big sampling because you know, you, that's not a security issue. Absolutely. So my question to you is, how far are you in terms of pushing that extension to ONF? So this... Uh, the, this is our attempt of presenting the work to the community and hopefully ma finding people who are interested in doing that. We haven't done anything official. <laughs> um, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have time for one more question. I have a question. Okay. So, um, so I guess the idea is to reduce the load in the controller by excluding the sort of elephant flows, the majority of the packets. So does that mean an attacker can sort of um, game this by making his flows look like an elephant initially and benign and then starting, you know? That's a very good question. Those are things that we, th for any kind of security kind of work, once you come up with a solution, there are these kind of gamings. The cost for the attacker is going to be very high. The problem that you don't see multiple flows of the same host is not that the attacker doesn't try to do that. Usually in the case of, uh, let's say, TCP connections, the recipient, the destination doesn't reply to those. That's why you have failures. But in the case of UDP, what we are looking at is one-way direction of flows. So if the attacker keeps sending packet, you might identify it as a legitimate traffic, even though the receiver is actually dropping those packets. But the, the thing is, it's coming at an extra cost. If the attacker needed to send one UDP packet per port, in the previous scheme, now they have to send multiple packets. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.